question is that um, we truly believe that no woman in the state of Iowa should go without um, the care that they need for an unplanned pregnancy. And, and what we have going on in our state is there is a gap, but there is a, there is a gap of care for a woman who is in an unplanned pregnancy. And so we have um, several clinics across the state of Iowa where we provide those needs um, in, in, a, in a medical fashion. So we're a, a, a third party accredited medical clinic. We are a nonprofit and we're a faith based organization. So we provide free medical care. Um, our tagline is Strength for Life's Tough Choices. One thing um, that is very important to, to grasp and understand is that 50% um, of the abortions in the state of Iowa are performed on college students. So um, college students are very vulnerable to abortion. They're also very vulnerable to um, the activities that lead to an unplanned pregnancy. So it's not just actually a very small portion of the unplanned pregnancies in the state of Iowa are on high school students. I know a lot of people think, oh, it's mostly high school students. But a lot of it is, is that, um, is that a student um, who is a freshman in college. And that's what we see a lot. So, um, just to tell you a little bit about myself and how we got involved with this, I was talking about this earlier. My husband and I um, grew up and, and live in Iowa City. We, we were both born in that area. And um, we left the state for a little bit to go to college. And then we decided, and we, we, we um, worked with a mission where we would take troubled teens up to the mountains and we would um, leave them there until they weren't troubled anymore. You know, <laughs> you know it was amazing what not having food and shelter and clothes will do. No. <laughs> anyway, so we um, we loved that. But when we, we went to college and then we decided to have children, and we still haven't obviously stopped having children, and we came back and we wanted to raise our family here near our family. So this is our sixth child. Um, this one was a, a little bit of a surprise. We're kind of, a, we um, use natural family planning. That's, we, our children are always planned. I was just telling Heather, I always pick which month they're going to be born in because it's, you know, it's planned, right? Well, this one was unplanned. And I looked at my husband and I said, we have five more clinics to open. How are we going to do this? And it was so precious because we just had that one moment of fear. And we felt that fear that the young women that we serve feel. You know, we felt that little fear like, how is this fitting into our life? And granted, it was only a few minutes, you know, and then of course the Lord slapped us upside the face and said, hey, this isn't about you. <laughs> it's, about, it's about him. And so um, we're very blessed and very excited that God has blessed us. But we have this heart for this mission because when we were, um, about eight years ago, we were contemplating on where and what God had for us. What was our next step? And, and at that time, we had found out what the abortion rate was in Iowa City. And it is, at that time, it was about 3,000 abortions a year. And at that time, it was the highest per capita in the country because of Iowa City being so small. And my husband looked at me, and he said, well, I think this is why we're here. He says, you need to go do something about that. So, of course, I decided we went and did something about that. Of course, he's great. He stays with the kids, and I run around the state and do something about that. So we started a nonprofit um, with a group of friends and pastors and Knights of Columbus. We have some fun Knights of Columbus gentlemen on our board. And we just um, really created this great group of people that have a passion to... Um, to love women who are in a situation where they don't know how valuable they are. They don't know if they're valuable. They don't know that the life inside of their womb is valuable. They don't know that they were created in the image of God and that the baby in their womb was created in the image of God. And so we built this organization around letting women know how valuable they are. So we look 
looked at several different models to look at, and that's when we came up with the medical model and just saw how effective it was to have an ultrasound to show women what's happening inside of their womb. Statistically, 95% of women who have an abortion will tell you that um, they wish somebody would have given them more information. So these are women, this is actually stats right out of the abortion industry. So these are women, they have just left the abortion clinic. And they'll say, I wish somebody would have told me what that was going to entail. I had no idea what was going on fetal development wise. I didn't know I would feel this way. I didn't know the spiritual entity of it. I didn't know. All I was thinking was I was afraid and I wanted it to end. And 90% of women who had an abortion will tell you that they regret that decision with every fiber of their being. So we knew that information was the key, that we could stand strong on the truth. And, and, and we could go take that very far. So that's when we went with the medical model. And it's so precious. What we do is, is really incredible. We, when that young girl, we have what's called a linear service. Like our end goal, our end goal when that young girl comes in her door, scared and frightened alone, our end goal is for her to be strengthened. To know and have information because knowledge is power, right? We need to encourage her and empower her and strengthen her. She walks in the door, she's scared and frightened. What we do is we sit down with her and we're getting some feedback. Are we okay? I'm sorry. You have to have it so loud. I've been having a cold and allergies and when you have all those kids around loving on you. It's, uh, I need a little bit of volume here. So Anyway, so when they come in, within 15 minutes of them coming into one of our clinics, we sit down with them and we go through what's called an Ottawa Decision Guide. It's actually the pros and cons sheet that's used in hospitals all over the world and in, in the oncology departments. Or in, in sometimes it's used on college campuses for um, social work and that kind of a thing. But it really is this laid out um, pros and cons sheet. And the preciousness of it is, is that um, they get to sit down in their own handwriting with one of our nurses. See, our, all of our services are done by medical professionals. And so they get to sit down with one of our nurses and fill out um, what are their choices? Adoption, parenting, and abortion. And what are the pros and cons of each one of those? And how do they rate that? Where are they at with that? emotionally, spiritually, and physically. And the beautiful thing is, is when they sit down, they take the time to write that out. It's amazing. Their needs pop off that sheet of paper. For the first time, sometimes they even see their needs that they didn't know that they had. Because remember, fear is driving them. And I don't know about you guys, but the decisions I've made in my life that have been focused on fear, And so what we're doing is we're helping take that fear and set it aside and really think. You know, when a woman is under stress, statistically there's, um, you know, they've done research on this, that she can only learn three new things. Now normally a woman can learn about eight to ten things in one sitting, like in a lecture or whatever. Men can only learn about six because they're thinking about other things. But anyways, but the, you guys don't get that. <laughs> Anyways, um, uh, so we can only, we only have so much time with her. And we only have so much mental energy to figure out what's going on in her life to meet those needs. So we really work hard within 15 minutes of her coming in to sit down and start on that. And then the precious thing is, is one thing is, a, I'm excuse me, <clears throat> a woman makes a decision to have an abortion within 24 hours of finding out that she's had an unplanned pregnancy. And so, well, we, we don't have very much time at all. We need to figure out, we need to find out what her needs are, and her needs. So sometimes, her needs are purely informational. We've already talked about this. She just needs to know 
what's going on? What is an abortion? So she sits down with our nurse, and our nurses walk her through. What is an abortion? And I can't tell you how many times young women have said, I had no idea that's what it was. Oh, thank you, dear. I did a service around it. Yeah. Um, I had no idea that's what an abortion was. I could never do that. But see, she would have ran to the abortion clinic if she hadn't taken the time to, to come and have a second opinion. That's how we advertise. We actually advertise on the campuses all over the state that you need to get a second opinion. That there's somebody making money off of your choice, and you need to get a second opinion. That's putting those questions in their mind, that they do need more information. And it's amazing, because they want more information, they just don't know, because they're so focused on fear. And so what, it, what we're trying to do is just help them work through this. And so what happens is, when they come down, sit down, we find out what their needs are. Those informational needs, we start meeting those. Um, and then those physical needs. Now sometimes, honestly, about 70% of the women that we work with, their family will rally around them. I'll tell you what, I believe in, in Iowa exceptionalism. Iowa is a beautiful place. The people here are some of the most incredible people in the country. In the world, in my opinion, because this is where I come from, you know, I got, I mean, I sort of animal stuff, you know, that whole area of Minnesota, I think all the people there I related to. Because my great grandma was there and, and they had fifteen kids, so you know that <laughs> anyways, and that was hundred years ago, so was, so they're all related now. But okay, so I think that I was exceptional. It's not just because I'm related to most of you. It's because they're good. And these families rally around these girls and they don't drop them. But the girls don't tell their parents. See, they think that they're not going to be accepted and they don't know they're valuable and they don't know they're really being valuable because they're caught up in the culture. And so sometimes it just takes them breathing and settling down and realizing that yes, I am valuable. And then about 30% of the girls that we work with do have some huge financial needs and some huge obstacles to overcome. So those can be domestic violence situations, those can be homelessness, those could be anything from um, not having a vehicle. We've had situations where girls come in, you know, they're trying to finish college. They're on their own. They don't have a support system, but they know they have to get through college, and here they have no plan pregnancy. How do I do this? I don't want to have an abortion, but I have no other way out, because there's no way I can get to school on the bus with a baby and get the baby to daycare and get the baby to school. What she needs is a car. So you know what we do? We go buy her a car. We will get her what she needs. It is the obstacle that is keeping her. Whatever pops up on that sheet, we are going to bend over backwards because what's valuable is the life in her womb. And what's valuable is her. And for her to know that there are people out there that care about her and her future and her child and her family and her future and her health, it's huge. So we tell women when they come in, there's people that all the services here in these clinics are free because there are people in the community that love you enough to pay for this and enough to support you. And so what we do is we come alongside of them. Sometimes it means that we, we pay, we, we find a place for them to live. You know, the domestic violence shelters in Iowa City and across the state we've ran into are very violent places to raise children. It's very hard to get in there and get out and all that stuff. And so what we do, especially if there's a pregnancy involved, and she's like, I can't have a child in this shelter, there's no way. We'll, we'll get her a place. We will rally the churches, we will rally the troops, and we will find her a place to live and get her a job and all the other wonderful things. Out of the, out of the thousand women that have come to inform choices over the last six years across the state of Iowa who have chosen to carry their babies, who were abortion determined, we've seen a thousand. There's only been three that have lost their children to DHS because that is how closely we follow them. And those three girls, believe me, we must, I had them live with us. You know, and we worked really, really hard so that they wanted, but they had some 
um, some addictions and some things that they need to work with and some choices that they need to make. But we work really closely with these girls until they um, uh, are stable and on their feet. It's really important that we follow through. We have mentorship programs that we hook them up in. We have all kinds of programs that they, if they need it. But like I said, 70% of those girls don't even need those services because their family will rally because I want to just that way. Now, so after we've gone through and find out what her needs are, then we take her and we do a pregnancy test, we figure out what's going on physically, and then we go into the ultrasound room because we have to diagnose the pregnancy. We have to see what's going on inside of the womb. To be fully informed, we gotta know. A lot of young girls don't know by the time they think they're pregnant, by the time they've missed their first cycle, there is already a, anybody probably stickers for Heartbeat. There's already heartbeat. I guess I don't have the stickers. I have them all home, but anyway. <laughs> but there's already a heartbeat. She's six weeks along, and there's already heart. Well, it's actually definitely 20, 20, 21 days. There's already heartbeat after that. That, that ovulation. Isn't that incredible? This image that was created in the image of God, this human being, um, and I just I think that. Being able to create with God is the most blessed gift. I mean, as, as women, we have this incredible gift. We get this, and my husband always gets relished when I talk about this, but we have this beautiful thing called the uterus, and then we get to co create with God and make this human being that is a forever soul. This is cool stuff. This is a privilege. This is a gift. In our society, who's dead sent, dead set against God, has decided that this is not a gift. And it, it's, it is killing our kids and it's killing our girls. Our beautiful girls are believing the lie that it's not a gift. And so it's our job to stand up and say, hey, you know what? And, this little, and to show them this little person. I'll tell you what, the great thing about what we do is that I don't talk like this to these girls. You know, I just you're beautiful, your baby's beautiful, we just go look at your baby. So our nurse has taken her into the ultrasound room and show her this beautiful baby. And these girls are smart. You know, they look at it and they're like, that's a baby. That's beautiful. That's a gift. The ultrasound is such an amazing place. I'll tell you, did I ever tell you this part? The Knights of Columbus purchase all of our night uh, ultrasounds. Did you ever say that? I can't, I can't remember if I said that tonight or not. But we're so blessed because the Knights of Columbus um, here in the state of Iowa partner with us. And they're so, I mean, because I think it's because men are visual. We all know that men are visual, but they think that we all need ultrasounds everywhere so that everyone can see the babies, and I agree with them. And so we, were, we partner and they purchase those ultrasounds and we put them to use. And that is the clincher. So 91% of the women that come into our clinic saying, I need an abortion, and I need it yesterday, come and have their needs met, their real needs met, and then see that baby on the ultrasound. And there is no coercion going on, ladies and gentlemen. We just stand, stand back and we're like, I can't have an abortion. That's a beautiful thing. It's pretty incredible. So that's kind of the gist of what we do. Um, it's powerful. By the time that she she walks in our door, and she is pro-abortion because she wants an abortion, right? She's there for a second opinion because she you knows she needs more information, but she's not there because she thinks we're, that we're a, a pro-life organization that is going to help her out. She's there because she wants our free medical services to help her get more information. And when she comes in, has her knees met, sees her baby in the ultrasound, she leaves pro-life. And I, we have never had to say that word once. It's just information. And it's loving on her with the precious love of Jesus Christ. Loving her unashamedly. There's times where we don't even say that name. And they know it. Because they know there's people in the community that care about them. And care about their future. And it's really, it's, it's powerful. 
Now, another aspect of what we do that is really important on the campuses, when we're just talking about this outside, is that we do um, sexually transmitted disease and tra sexually transmitted infection testing and treatment. Now, right now in the United States, it is, well, let's just say we're not following the God's plan. And there's consequences to that. So if you have um, more than one partner um, in the United States right now, your chances of getting an STD, a sexually transmitted disease, is close to about 100%. So what's happening is that for years, I'm just going to be very frank here, if y'all don't mind, um, for years we've been told that if our kids have been told, I was told this in school, um, I won't tell you how long ago, but, <laughs> but um, that if you use a condom, it's okay. You're going to be protected. That's safe sex. You're going to be protected. You're not going to get anything. Well, the fact is, is that 50% of the time, it doesn't protect you from these STDs because a lot of these STDs are skin-on-skin -skin contact. If you can get herpes from just skin-on-skin, -skin, from kissing, I don't know if you've seen some of the stuff going around. There's, um, in the, um, they now have some rules in hospitals where you shouldn't kiss babies um, because there's been so many deaths from herpes, from people who have herpes of the mouth, herpes 2 of the mouth, and they kiss those babies on the face, and then the babies get herpes and die because they can't handle that at that time in their, in their newborns. Um, our, our, our newborn um, death rate has skyrocketed because of STDs. Uh, there is um, our cancer rates from HPV and those types of things have skyrocketed because of this. Um, all of those things are, so HPV, gonorrhea, and chlamydia, and herpes are, can all be contracted with skin on skin. And the condom, I'm just going to be very open here, only covers one part of the body. It doesn't cover the whole body. And so that's what's, what our kids are, are not being told the truth. They're not being given all the information because somebody is making money off of them not having all the information. The abortion clinic is making money off of these girls not knowing what fetal development is, not understanding what's going on with um, what, 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 what an abortion for you takes. They're making money off of that. They're making money off of treatment of STDs. This is, this is a money-making proposition. And so our kids are not being told the truth. And it's time for that to end. Because what's happening is um, we have a lot of young women who are scarred and damaged from life because of these STDs. This is where I try not to get a little emotional. I'll tell you a quick little story. There was this beautiful, beautiful girl who came into the clinic. She was 19.
what happens with this retinol drug is the girls pass out and they don't know what's going on until probably about a week later they start to catch on and maybe something happened that night. So she knew that she had been raped. And so she came to us for STD testing a couple weeks later. And so we did the STD testing, but as we were talking with her and finding out what was going on in her life, she said that she had one sexual partner when she was 15 and thought he hung with me, and he probably did. Mm. He was quite a bit older than her. And um, she had gotten chlamydia from him. So she had one sexual partner until she was raped, right? And um, she had gotten chlamydia from him. But chlamydia goes undiagnosed for about, not for about 60% of the time. In young men and women, it goes undiagnosed. And so, she had, um, it had, she didn't have any symptoms. That, I'm sorry, I said that wrong. It goes without any symptoms about 60% of the time. And so she had gone without symptoms, and so she didn't get treated. And it had turned into pelvic inflammatory disease. Now, pelvic inflammatory disease actually um, causes scar tissue in the fallopian tubes. And so by the time she was 17, the doctor said that she would never conceive. So here you are, have this beautiful girl, comes to the university, doesn't think she's valuable. Who's going to want her? She's never going to have children. Gets into the situation. It was so amazing when she came to us. I know it seems like a sad story, but God is our redeemer, right? He can take what the enemy meant to destroy us, and he can turn it for good for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. When she came to us, she rededicated her life to her faith. Um, and now, today, she has gone to college, and now she is talking in schools and high schools about um, having sex and, and, and STDs and getting tested and how important that is, and about um, abstinence and about God's divine plan for marriage and for sex and how that goes together. He, God is not a killjoy here. You guys have heard this before. He loves us if sex is designed for marriage. That's where it's beautiful and where it's healthy and it fulfills what he designed it to. But outside of that, there's huge consequences. So about 70% of what we do in Informed Choices is STD testing. We're on the college campuses and we do free testing for men and women. And we sit down, each one of them, with one of our nurses one on one for half an hour. And they go over the side effects and the risks of having more than one partner. And I'll tell you what, it's kind of remarkable. When they leave that room, they don't even want to touch a doorknob. It's just the greatest thing. You know, my husband actually jokes, like he calls me and he says, Well, where are you speaking tonight? What are you doing tonight? Because I'll speak to youth, I'll speak to youth groups, you know. And he calls it the scare their pants on and talk. <laughs> so are you talking to are you talking to the parents and raising money or are you talking to the kids and scaring their pants on? What are you doing tonight? I don't know. <laughs> but the thing is is that um, it's important that they know because these kids will sit in that room and their little jaws will drop and they'll say, Why hasn't anybody told us? Why why haven't we been told? And so it's really amazing for them to get to sit down with a nurse and have accurate medical information. And then as we're finishing up with that time with them, we end with, you know, if you would like prayer, we can pray for you. And this is God's divine plan for you to do. This is what sex is for. And we just lay it out very gently. It's not, it doesn't bash anybody over the head, but we feel like it's our responsibility to be able to share this. And we have more young people, just like the young woman I was just talking about, who have decided to choose abstinence and to turn that, their life to, to do a 180 from that and to really hold themselves as valuable and, and, and sacred in the gifts that God has given them, not only in their sexuality, but in, in who they are as a person. The valuable and worth the weight and worth being treasured and not a piece of meat or something to be taken advantage of. So that is the heart and the mission behind what we do at Informed Choices. 
we provide accurate medical information with the love of Jesus Christ to a generation that is really lost when it comes to knowing who they are, what their gifts are, and who God is. I'm going to open it up for questions now. Now, when I open it up for questions, and I'm in a room full of high schoolers, after I just gave that talk about condom they're all like, <laughs> so, I don't know about you guys. Or we, no. <laughs> so I'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have tonight. To an infectious disease, we have infectious disease um, physicians that we work with. Um, so if it's um, syphilis or HIV um, or anything in that realm, we'll refer out. But we do treat the gonorrhea and chlamydia. Um, we would also refer out um, for like um, HSV or herpes to the infectious disease. So, so you dispense the medication? Mm -hmm. Yeah. No. Well, we have our doctors will prescribe. Oh, prescribe. Um, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, our doctors will.
But until then, um, when Charlie is ready, you know, it, depending on the time frame, you know, if we get a building first and the Burlington facility, facility is up and running, then you know, we'll bring Charlie to town. But Charlie will be here for um, a couple of days a week until we get finished with him. It's a mobile medical clinic. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's outside, we can give you a tour of that. So the mobile medical clinic, did I, did I tell everybody in here this story yet? Did I not? I didn't do that, did I? The mobile, I had it out there. The mobile medical clinic is actually a full medical clinic. It's got a restroom in it. It's very compact though. Um, and so it is also accredited medical facility. And so um, it's got an exam table, ultrasound, and we do the full STD testing and pap smears and all those great things right there on it. And so the goal is to, to uh, be on the community college campuses and then um, to provide those free testing and then also um, if, you know, in an area lends to that, to be out in front of the um, abortion clinics. Asking the girls if they would like to see their baby before they have that abortion. They would like that second opinion and there's a medical clinic right there that can see that. This, this guy out here, his name is Charlie. And Charlie um, was a gentleman, he was a fourth degree night psychologist, and he actually um, prayed out in front of the abortion clinics on Wednesdays. And he also did that in Davenport. So in Iowa City, he was in Iowa City and in Davenport, and he prayed. Uh, and so he would ask the girls when he would see them, you know, um, they'd like to see their baby on ultrasound. And then also he would tell them that they were beautiful, and that their baby was beautiful, and that God loved them. He had a very gentle, gentle passion and gentle heart. I never quite understood why a girl would get in the car with him, but he was a grandfather kind of guy, so he was just this really sweet guy. And he would bring them over to our clinic, and then we would you know, show them their baby, and they would choose life, and so it was really fun. So, but Charlie went home to be with the Lord about a year and a half ago. And that's when we decided to go to medical uh, mobile, and um, so we decided to name him Charlie. So that's how Charlie got his name. And yes, everyone thinks that he's a real person, and I affectionately love, and I do love Charlie, so. <laughs> so that is the Mobile Medical Clinic. We're really excited. It's, it's landing home will be Des Moines, so that particular mobile clinic will um, spend the rest of his days in Des Moines, um, in, on the college campuses, and in front of abortion clinics in Des Moines. So there's about 3,000 abortions, and I was sitting about 3,000 abortions in Des Moines, and so um, those are the target areas where we're at. We have a, one, one of the reasons why we have a chain, and why we're working on that, and why we're working across the state, is because we want to compete directly with Planned Parenthood. They do a really good job of being in the high schools, and they do a really good job of advertising. And so because they have a chain, so what we're doing is we are um, hoping to compete with that directly. So over the next um, five years, we have a 2020 vision. We'll have a unit, uh, a brick and mortar and a mobile medical clinic that we'll launch every year for the next five years until we have the whole state covered so that every woman in the state of Iowa will have access to free medical care um, during that early prenatal, um, during, during her early um, pregnancy. So she'll have access to that early prenatal care and diagnosis. Does anybody have any other questions? Yes, sir. How often, you, you talk about seeing the girls, how often do you see the guys come in with them? Ah, thank you. Thank you for bringing that up because I think I left that part off. So we work really diligently to get the family in the door. Because we know that 60% of the time, I was telling the ladies out in the van this, that 60% of the time abortions are coerced by the man in her life. So it could be her father. It could be the father of the baby, it could be her husband. And so we work really hard to get them in the door, to see that ultrasound. And um, uh, it's usually about 50% of the time we'll get that man in. But what happens is really incredible. Um, if that man who is pressuring her support comes into the clinic and he sees the baby on the ultrasound, um, it is like 99% of the time he will choose to pick up her. Because men are visual. And anything they see on a 52 inch screen TV, they want, right? Isn't that right? 
So, um, but it really is it's that visual thing, and we call it the room where, where fathers are born because they instantly become nurturers, providers, and protectors. And that's really what it's what it's about. It's about them seeing and understanding that this baby is real. To them, in their mind, it's just pregnancy. That's kind of the going one right now. It's pregnancy. Well, pregnancy, they don't. It doesn't equal a life to them. And so, but they need to see that. And it's crazy. I mean, these guys, I had one young man in there one day. It was so precious. Um, you know, they were in a really dire situation. She had um, no support at home. They were both freshmen in college. And they were just excited about life and excited to, you know, they were supporting each other. And he had some support, but there was, um, you know, it just was overwhelming to them to be present. But they came in and they saw that baby, and um, I'll tell you what, it was really precious because he was jumping around the room. His, at 11 week old baby on an ultrasound, it's pretty amazing. They, they like to, they jump, they hop. And so this, this 11 week old was hopping, and he grabs me and he starts jumping all over the room. He's like, it's moving, it's alive. <laughs> at the same like rhythm of the baby, he's jumping all over the room, and he's like, Oh man, I just saw the cutest cowboy outfit the other day. And I was just sitting <laughs> So he's, you know, and they're instantly over there, you know, rubbing on them. Mom, do you, do you want some ice cream pickles? And, you know, it's just, it really is um, precious. And the neat thing is, is that we're able to come around them because they're a new family. You know, they didn't know it. And maybe before they came to the clinic, they were in denial of it. But now in that room, they're a family. And the precious thing is, is that um, we're able to rally around them, find them the support that they need, whether it's mentorship and being a father, or mentorship and being a mother, we'll hook them up with that. And that's what's really important, is that follow-up is very, very important. So, and making sure that they have their, their needs met. So, any other questions? satellite clinic and so what we have is we have a nurse manager in the clinic and we're set up kind of like a nursing home so we have nurse um, uh, standing orders and then we have nurse care plans and so that's how everything is set up and um, she so that nurse manager runs the clinic and she's the only paid staff at the clinic and the rest are volunteers so the physicians the nurse um, oh I'm sorry I, I didn't mean to do that to you I've never been so mic'd in my life. This is crazy. Um, anyways, and so uh, where was I at? So they um, work. They have one paid staff. And yeah, so they have one paid staff and the rest are volunteers. So the nurse practitioners, the the, um, the radiologists, the, the doctors are all volunteer. And then we have that one paid nurse who manages all of that. She manages the volunteer nurses who come in. We have um, the nurses are trained in um, limited obstetrical ultrasound, meaning they're just trained in that diagnosis of pregnancy. So they send that. Um, so we're just doing like a beautiful, or we're just figuring out if this pregnancy is viable. And then that goes to the radiologist, and then we get back to them and let them know that um, it, whether the pregnancy was um, viable was from the doctor. Letting them know what the doctor saw. Getting people to volunteer to work here? Uh, you shouldn't come and volunteer. Are you a nurse? Well, I'm not a nurse. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, we need volunteers. We always need volunteers to cover those hours. We um, we like the nurses to do like four hour shifts um, a week so that they're there and because there's policies and procedures you have to memorize and there's just stuff to do. So it's important that you're there at least once a week to, to stay on top of stuff. And then, um, yeah, so we need receptionists. We also, so non-medical volunteers are important. We need receptionists. We also have assistants who are in the ultrasound. We have to have witnesses in the ultrasound room. We have witnesses in the STD room. So we have different positions available. So you can get all of that online. We do have, um, there's some information here that Rhonda will pass out. Rhonda Morrison grew up in this area. She's actually our liaison for the church liaison. She 
coordinates the churches and liaisons to find volunteers and financial support and those kinds of things in the area. And also to let people know in the area that our services and you know, what's available. And so she's kind of the go-to girl around here. But um, I don't know, Rhonda, if you want to pass out some stuff. We also are having a fundraising banquet here coming up um, in October. I can't say the date right now. 19, thank you. Um, and on, um, so it's really, we're going to have um, Pam Stensel come and speak. I'm going to speak a little bit. She's dynamic. She speaks on um, more in detail on abstinence and what's going on in our culture and how our young people are being led astray. She really has a passion and heart. She also has a passion for life. She was conceived in Ruth. Um, her mother was, I think, a 13 year old and um, placed her in um, an adopted home. And so she's just very full of life. She, she really is. Um, so she's fun to listen to, too. You know, um, a lot of people ask why. I know I'm asking the questions. This is great. Does anybody have any other questions? I can, I can ask myself a question. Am I out of time? Am I good? OK. Well, um, a lot of people ask me, so what, why, why are you so passionate about this? Well, I, I am very passionate about life in, in general because uh, my mother um, was pregnant with me when she was very young. I was not. And she was in a situation that um, most people would have an abortion because when I was born, I destroyed life. She had an affair. She was um, with an older man. Um, and it was very heartbreaking for everyone involved. But instead of running to an abortion clinic, abortion had just become illegal, or legal, I said that wrong, had just become legal in the United States. Um, now I'm, I'm revealing my age. And um, so she could have run to the abortion clinic, but she chose not to. And she was an amazing woman. And I'll tell you what, um, we had a couple of years there that were rough, but Even though she does have um, a couple of children, I am her favorite. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, it is. I mean, she loves my brothers. And stuff. I love my brothers, but you know. So, life is precious. I have six children that wouldn't be here today um, if she hadn't chosen. So, uh, and, and her faith is precious and strong. And, just, it's an important thing. I think that we underestimate. Most people would have looked at her and said, you know, you're going to end in poverty. Your life is going to be ruined. It's going to be trash. It's going to, you know, we have, we don't get to make that call. That's God's call, the value of life. And so what we have done in our culture is we create the culture that is so, um, focused on everything being perfect, that we don't see that sometimes out of the ashes can come something beautiful. Anyways, that's, that's what makes me tick and talk and all that good stuff. So. Anybody have any other questions? Okay, the banquet is free, and we are celebrating that thousandth birthday um, of those thousand babies that have been saved through the medical Come and join us and uh, meet Pam um, and um, the rest of our board, and, and there'll be lots of amazing people. There's going to be a fun evening, so I invite you all to come. And if you guys don't have any more questions, I can wrap this up. Do you have a question? Let's give Rachel a big hand.